Okay, so welcome to this talk called Tips and Tricks Learn from Building Production Shiny Apps. So a bit about me. Um, so uh, my name is Colin Fay. So I work um, for a company called Fincar in France. Um, I also do a lot of um, open source uh, development. Uh, I'm the lead developer of the Golem project and I've written a book called Engineering Production Grade uh, Shiny Apps. You can find me on the web, uh, either on our um, website called uh, artask.fincar.fr, or you can uh, reach out on Twitter or GitHub too. Uh, so I'm here to talk uh, to you about um, one situation uh, we've all uh, faced, which is um, this one uh, when building a software, because I think we've all been there to uh, situation where we say to ourselves, I wish I had known this before. Um, I think when we start a project, we might not expect the project to last that long or uh, to become that complex. And uh, I think that at some point in time uh, when building shiny apps or building any software, we all say to ourselves, uh, I wish I had known this before. And my idea with this talk is to, um, give you some of the things I wish I had known um, before I start my uh, before I start, started my uh, shiny journey. So just a small disclaimer, this is not a talk about uh, coding. There is, uh, of course, there's going to be, of course, a bit of code, but um, I'm going to try to give you um, some advice uh, about how to um, to manage your project or to be prepared for everything, how to uh, build or to um, work on the project. So um, this is not talk about, a talk about um, writing code per se. This is a talk about um, project management and um, how to build uh, robust shiny apps and uh, how to manage projects. So basically what I'm going to talk about is um, First, I'm going to give you a definition of what I mean by uh, production. So we hear a lot of um, talk about production. Uh, there are conferences about production. There are books about production. But um, I'm going to try to give you uh, my definition of what production is. Then I'm going to talk about one of the most important step about uh, building shiny apps, which is the step of designing and prototyping, um, which consists first of uh, designing before uh, writing the code and the importance of um, user experience or uh, UX. And then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the stuff um, I wish I had known about building, uh, for example, the importance of um, building then optimizing. Uh, the difference between a piece of code which is elegant and a piece of code which is efficient. Um, and of course, um, the importance of uh, testing everything um, inside a shiny project. So um, last part is about uh, everything not tested will uh, eventually fail. So first of all, um, there are conferences about uh, sending shiny to production. Uh, I've written a book about um, writing shiny apps for production, but um, it's kind of hard to uh, find a good definition of what uh, production mean. So uh, this is my definition of um, production about um, my definition of uh, what um, uh, of when we can say that uh, software is in production. So first of all, of course, it's used. Uh, that seems like uh, obvious but it's the most one of the most important thing is that if nobody is using your uh, software then it's not in production so if nobody is using your shiny app it's not a production uh, shiny app it's relied upon um, which is kind of the uh, most important uh, thing of his definition is that people using your shiny application are go are are going to rely upon 
your application for doing that job. Uh, they are going to take decision. Uh, they are going to, um, yeah, they're going to need your application to um, do their everyday job. And it's why a software in production is uh, relied upon. And of course, um, it has real life impact. Uh, so basically, it's a bit linked with the um, second point. But basically, if a software is in production, uh, it has real life impact uh, for the users, but also for the developers. Um, that means that um, when something has real life impact, what I mean by that is that if your software fails, fails at some point, if it gives incorrect results, if someone can't use your software, it has an impact on the life. Uh, so they can't do the job. Um, I don't know, they can't produce the report for the boss. They can't, I don't know, a lot of, um, lot of things, uh, for example, if, um, I don't know, you're building an app for um, making decision uh, either, um, I don't know, to, you're working for a bank and um, it's for uh, giving discount to clients. And basically if your app doesn't work, then uh, the users can't give um, discounts to the clients because your app um, doesn't work. So um, people rely on this app to give you to give them results. And if this app doesn't work, it has an impact on their day-to-day -day, uh, life. And of course, it has a real life impact also for the uh, developer, the developers, because at some point, if the software fails, so if you can't, if the users can't access your app, uh, someone is going to be called and someone is going to have to uh, fix the bug. Uh, so it has real life impact either for the user because they need it uh, to do the job and it has real life impact for the developers because um, they are going to be the one uh, that are going to be called to fix uh, the bug. So this is my definition of um, what is a software in production and I like this definition because um, it doesn't really um, uh, I, um, we don't think about production about something with millions of users um, because this is something that you are going to hear a lot that, uh, for example, Shiny is not for production because it's not scalable. You can't have millions of users. But um, I think very few software in production have millions of users. Uh, basically, most um, professional or production software are used by a small number of people. Um, so even if you are building an app, just, uh, I don't know, you are a small company or a startup and you're building an app for yourself, uh, I don't know, for doing something for your job, it's in production because you are using it, you rely on this app and it has impact on you um, uh, when something goes wrong. So even if it's just with one user, it's still a production uh, software. So how to be uh, prepared for building a software that is uh, production ready? I think that one of the most important thing to do, and uh, we can have a hard time doing it uh, as software engineers, as data engineers, as data scientists. Uh, but the idea is that we first need to design and then we need to code. Uh, because the idea is, um, even if uh, you want to start coding, you want to rush into coding, this is the first thing you want to do. Um, basically the designing part uh, is one of the most important of all um, because it allows you to, um, to be prepared and just to think ahead uh, instead of uh, coding. And what I mean by that is, uh, Designing is important. And um, one of the things is that you don't rush um, into coding. And uh, this is something that I've done um, in the past uh, before. Basically, you have a project and you have an idea. Uh, you want to build this app. 
uh, you see everything in your head, you have a good idea of where you want to go. And the first thing you do is you open uh, your IDE and you start writing code and code and code. And at some point um, you hit a problem or you hit a bottleneck and you realize that uh, you have rushed into building something instead of uh, thinking. So the design part is um, very important. And of course, the uh, analyze, uh, and I, analyzing the needs of your future uh, user is very important. Because we have this tendency as uh, developers just to rush into coding, as I said uh, before, uh, so the thing we want to do with the thing we like to do is uh, writing lines of code. And um, basically we can have um, issues if we do that because we, instead of thinking about the big pictures, instead of thinking about the users, we just uh, rush into writing the uh, algorithms and writing the backend and writing, uh, I don't know, connection to databases and stuff like that. And the first, first thing we do is writing code. And I think this is not a good practice and I wish, so I've done, I've done it um, a lot and I wish at some point I uh, didn't because um, you write code and at some point you realize that it's not correct or it's useless because you haven't uh, think about something uh, unexpected and uh, something you, you wish uh, you had uh, seen uh, ahead. So, don't rush into coding. This is like my first advice. Just, um, just sit down and take some tools and start planning ahead. So two tools I like to, um, um, I like to use to do that are um, concept maps. So concept maps are a way to, um, to design, um, to think about how all the pieces are going to work uh, together. So this is a small uh, concept map I've uh, written for an application to create X stickers. Um, so basically the idea is to uh, take all the pieces from the project and write all the interactions between all the pieces of the app and what it helps uh, with is that you have a big picture, you think about all the pieces of your app, you write them down, you write the interactions. And um, once you have that, you can show it to your client, show it to your users and say, this is how I think it should work. These are all the parts of um, the tool, this is, how they are going to interact with each other. Uh, do you think everything is there? Um, do you think you want something more? Um, and then you can agree on that. Um, and then you can start working and at any point in time, um, you can go back to this map and you can have a look and say, okay, this is the part that, um, that, manage, uh, that manages the, um, I don't know, the writing to the DB. Uh, can the user browse the external DB? Um, can the user restore an X sticker? Uh, can, it re can, uh, can he export as the PNG? Uh, can he export as a .x and then restore the app? So we have here, uh, so this is um, something designed with a tool called XMind. And basically we have here all the parts of the application, all the things that, um, that are going to be designed and how they interact with each other. And at the end of a project, uh, when you think you have uh, finished your project, you can still go back to this app and say, okay, this part is there, this part is there, uh, this part is not, uh, et, cetera, et cetera, So this is a very good tool, um, just as um, something that you can use to, um, yeah, to put everything down and just to think about our, uh, the whole project. And in combination with these uh, concept maps, so something I uh, now do a lot is um, drawing 
a schema of the uh, UI. Because basically something I've um, met a lot when um, doing a project is that um, you, got, you just got the specification for your app. I want to do that, I want to do that, I want to do that. And you start coding and at some point the client says, okay, but can you add a button here uh, that will be used to do that? Um, or I don't know, can you, yes, can you add a button here that will allow me to export my app in a file and then re-upload it uh, after that? Or can you add like this feature of this feature? And it's kind of hard to, um, to decide whether or not it's part of uh, the scope uh, without this concept map and without this uh, schema. So basically, this is now something I do um, a lot for um, my project is, um, so this is done with Excalibur Row. So this is a free tool online. Um, and this is like a UI prototype for uh, minifying. So this is, um, this is a shiny app where you can upload a file and you can minify uh, the file. So basically it takes, uh, so this is something you do with JavaScript and CSS file where you just uh, um, bundle everything and it outputs a smaller file. Um, and basically this is a good example because um, you think about your UI, you say there, there is going to be a button to upload here, a select input, a button to launch, and then you can download and on the right side, you've got like two uh, places somewhere with the original file and then uh, something with the output. And basically it allows you to just as the concept map to uh, agree on the UI, agree on the features. And um, again, you can come back and say, okay, um, when you start coding, okay, I'm building this part, this part, this part. And if you want to add a new feature, um, you can always come back there and say, no, sorry, this wasn't in the original design, in the original uh, schema. Um, so basically uh, the idea is to, um, to be prepared and to have a, a big picture uh, for the application. So the concept map, then you draw a schema for the UI and then two of the tools um, that I'm using uh, once I start uh, coding is um, for the backend, I choose to write uh, everything in a flat file. So in RMD, uh, basically the idea is to um, take everything that concerns the um, backend, write it in a markdown and uh, so that I'm, uh, I'm able to share with my clients and say, this is, these are, all the uh, backend logic, uh, this is all the backend logic, this is, uh, these are all the um, business functions that are going to, I'm going to use. So uh, for example, um, I'm connecting to my DB, I'm doing like a query, then I'm filtering, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, So this allows to discuss the backend logic uh, without, having to either deploy the application or having to think about um, the uh, interaction with all the uh, interactive logic on offline. And on the other end, what I do is that I have this uh, UI, so this, draw, this schema of a UI, uh, and then I'm filling everything with some random element. So um, we build a package called shine ipsum. Um, so the idea is to have something like lorem ipsum. So lorem ipsum is um, fake text that you can, uh, that is used on the web to uh, fill the um, pages. Uh, so shine ipsum are, for example, here it's a random ggplot. And I start with this schema, I build a UI, I put random parts there and the idea is that I can show um, my clients or my users. This is what the application is going to uh, look like. This is not the real output. This is not the real data. This is just some random elements uh, just to fill the page, but this is how it looks like. So you have one 
Markdown for the backend, and you've got one um, Lorem Ipsum app with random element just to have a good sense of uh, what the uh, UI will uh, look like. I'm just going to take a sip of water. Okay, so this is for the uh, design part. So the design part is um, very important um, and um, start with this part um, instead of starting coding straight away. And of course, on top of uh, designing, you have to think about, um, do some uh, analysis uh, of the context. For example, who are the end users? Um, are they tech literate? Uh, are there people who use, uh, I don't know, um, your shiny app on uh, their iPhone or an iPad? Or uh, are they people in a, a laboratory that are going to do experiments um, at the same time? Um, who are they? So all, ask yourself a lot of questions uh, that will impact um, the end uh, project. Uh, for example, if you know that your end users uh, are going to have um, a low internet connection or they are going to use your Shiny app on their iPhone uh, while, I don't know, on the move uh, in an hotel room or anything or during conference or uh, they are using your app, I don't know, um, somewhere and not at the desk but somewhere else uh, and they don't know really they don't really know how to use computer when they, they are not used to um, doing this data analysis uh, and such basically this is something that you need to know before uh, you start coding so who are they and uh, how does this impact the way you are going to build your uh, application of course, is there uh, any pre-existing code base? Um, because, um, for example, um, you can, uh, I don't know, you, you are going to build a Shiny app and people have an algorithm and they want a Shiny app that when you upload a CSV and then it launches the algorithm and they get a plot, I don't know, something like that. Um, basically, um, if, this algorithm already exists. Um, how does it work? Are there any dependencies? Uh, for example, is it doing modeling? Do you need like weird Linux system requirements, stuff like that? Uh, is there any, yeah, is there any pre existing code base? Um, and uh, how does it work? Um, what does it need? Uh, so, this is um, in. Uh, Urbanism, this is called green versus brown project. So green project is you start, you know, from uh, grass. Uh, so you start with nothing and you just build, uh, you just build a house and a brown project is you start uh, over something that already exists. Uh, and of course, something very important, uh, where will the app be deployed? For example, is it going to be deployed? Uh, uh, I don't know, behind a proxy on an internal server that only has R4.0.1 and uh, this version of the CRAN and this, I don't know, it's a, it's a CentOS uh, server with this and that. Uh, because basically it's kind of um, something you want to know upfront. Um, for example, um, so a small story about um, something I wish I had known before. Uh, we were building a Shiny app and um, it had some uh, geolocation inside uh, the app. And basically when you clicked on a button, it was trying to reach an API with coordinates and try to guess which city you are from. So you click on a button, the server asks the API, it has the city and then uh, it brings uh, the city inside the app. So it works well. Um, it works well on my computer. It works well on my client computer. Um, we deploy it in production and uh, then the users call and it doesn't work. 
So we spend like, I don't know, maybe one day or two just trying to debug and try to, uh, to, to see if it's one of our function. Uh, is it the shiny app? Is it something like that? And we end up realizing that the server where the app was deployed doesn't have access to the internet. Uh, so basically we're, we weren't expecting the server to be in a remote location without access to the internet. And we hadn't asked uh, this uh, question. And basically we, we lost like two days trying to debug something that we couldn't, we couldn't uh, debug. And basically I wish, uh, yeah, I wish I had known this uh, before coding this feature of calling the API, which was like a smart solution because you enter, you know, you pin something on the map and then takes the coordinates and then calls the API. So it was kind of elegant. It was kind of smart, but uh, it doesn't work because, you know, on the server without internet, it doesn't work. So this was for my first uh, tip. And then my second tip, something uh, I wish uh, I had known before is that at the end of the day, code doesn't matter. Uh, only user experience does. Because whenever you write a shiny app, um, you focus on the backend, you are going to write some awesome algorithm, you are going to, uh, to write some smart way to connect to the database, to create the data, to build the plot and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, uh, when you are going to show your application, the client is going to say, okay, that's cool, but can you make this button blue? Or can you make this, uh, you know, uh, around or, so, or something like that? And as a developer, it feels weird uh, because, you know, you spend so many time writing the backend and they just focus on the color of, of a button or things like that. And this is because, yeah, at the end of the day, what matters is the, um, user experience. And what I, mean, what I mean by that is usability and uh, accessibility. So usability is um, the fact that when people are going to start using your app, um, you don't want them to feel stupid. Because we've all been, you know, sometimes you, you go to a website, try to do something and it doesn't work. Uh, you try to click and click and it doesn't like, you feel, you feel stupid because you don't understand how it works. Um, so usability is the idea of making your application simple so that um, just finding the right amount of widgets, the right amount of, um, you know, of, interaction and of things to display for it to feel for the application to feel easy to use because you don't want your user to feel stupid uh, because you know we've all seen like i don't know my my father is very bad with computer and every time he uh, takes his phone he says i must be very stupid because i don't know how this works and at the end of the day i think it's not that it's stupid it's just that it's badly designed and yeah, you don't want your user to feel that way. So you have to focus on finding the right amount of something that's useful, but not too much. And this is something we see with widgets. You're going to have a lot of widgets, but sometimes it's kind of useless because there are uh, so many things. And uh, so, yeah, trying to simplify the um, application to be usable. So this is usability and there is of course uh, accessibility. So accessibility is the idea that it should work for everybody. Um, so if you build a shiny app for a company, they are going to uh, deploy it for the users and inside these people, there might be some people with uh, screen readers. There might be some people, some people that are column line. There might be some people that have mobility issues etc etc and basically um, for example if you are doing data analysis you are going to display plots and display 
things like that. And for example, colorblindness, it can be hard for someone to read with colorblindness. Uh, it can be hard for them to um, read some uh, color palette. Uh, if you are using a lot of widgets, uh, it can be hard for people with screen readers um, to use your application. Um, if there are a lot of things you need to click on uh, just to uh, display um, the results, people with mobility issue can have trouble doing it, for example, people with Parkinson uh, or people that can only use keyboard and that can, can't use a mouse. Um, there are all these things uh, that you want to uh, take into account. Um, so for example, with um, an app, uh, we, were, we chose to display a graph with um, uh, the uh, Viridis palette. Uh, so the Viridis palette is uh, palette that can be seen by um, every type of color blindness. And the client ended up saying, uh, I don't want this one, I want this one. And we were like, no, but uh, the palette you've chosen is uh, bad for uh, color blind people. They can't read it, they can't see. Um, and basically they ended, uh, the client ended up saying, I don't care, I just want this one. So yeah, we put this one, but it was a bad choice because someone with, uh, Someone with colorblind uh, is going to have some issue using the app. This is something very important that you have to take uh, into account when you are uh, building that. So this all comes to the idea that uh, less is more um, because basically um, when you are um, building an app, uh, you want to head many things, uh, you want to have many widgets, you want to have many features, but um, at the end, less is more because of the way uh, we read the web. Uh, and you have to follow the rule of least surprise and beware of the danger of uh, feature creep, but I'm going to describe just after that. So basically the way we read the web, so, you are going to think that um, you're building the app and people are going to read um, to read it uh, the way uh, that is displayed on the left. But at the end of the day, you are just, people are just going to pick stuff and just uh, trying to see if people are, things are clickable, are going to click on it, go back, etc. Um, this is why, um, so it, it, um, this is why you should try to do something um, simple because the reality is that people don't actually read you know they don't read the documentation so we developers don't read the documentation but users don't read uh, everything that's on your app so if it's kind of complex if there are a lot of things on the page and a lot of widgets and a lot of things um, a lot of things to to do and other thing to understand um, it's kind of hard for them to uh, use the app so don't add things just for the sake of adding widgets and adding things. And of course, that goes with um, the idea that when you are building a shiny app, you should always do the least surprising thing. So um, a good example is um, links on the web. Whenever you go on a web page and you see something which is blue and underlined, you are going to expect it to be a link um, because this is the way it has always, always um, been done. And um, it's important when um, you are building your app not to try something too fancy, something too new, something too uh, bizarre. Uh, so knowing the uh, convention of the web and respecting them uh, is kind of important because if you are building um, a software for people that are using uh, this software on a daily basis to do their job, they want it to be easy. They don't want to have some, I don't know, some rainbows or some, uh, some stuff uh, that they don't expect uh, inside the app. They just want the app to work. So if this is something blue underline, uh, they want it to be a link because this is the way, uh, the way it has already been on, uh, the internet. And of course, uh, there is also the danger of uh, 
feature creep um, services like the same uh, so this is a small shiny app with a table on the left and a graph on the right uh, something we've seen a lot with uh, shiny is um, going by default for a dt data table so basically having even for something with 10 entries just having a, a data table uh, also um, having like a lot of uh, plotly plot um, because it's kind of very easy to turn a ggplot um, into a plotly but the thing is that with the example on the right there are so many buttons and so many things that have like that is noise so things that uh, people are not going to uh, understand people that people are going to have to explore before understanding uh, for example, if you show someone a plot leaf for the first time, so we've um, done that for uh, some of our clients. So you show them to people of someone who has never seen a plot leaf, and you show them a plot leaf. The first thing they are going to do is they are going to do over the buttons on the top, and they are going to try to understand what they are used for. Um, so basically, they are going to click to zoom to do stuff like that, and they are just going to waste like a couple of minutes trying to understand what it does. And if it doesn't work, if they don't understand, they're going to uh, feel stupid. So we're back to our um, usability issue. And it's the same for the uh, data table. If you have like so many things just for displaying 10 rows, uh, you don't need like a search, a pagination and everything. You just need like plain, plain old um, HTML table. My Fourth uh, tip is uh, to start with building and then uh, optimize. Um, because of course, um, you've heard this um, phrase before that premature optimization is the root of all evil. Um, because most of the time, when you are working on something, you want something to be fast. Uh, you want um, a new client, uh, they are going to ask, for the application to be fast or for some specific part to be fast. Um, but you have to think about how many time it takes, uh, how many time it's used, and how many time, um, you know, it, um, how many time it takes to optimize, how many time you can gain, and how many time it is used at the end. Because for example, if you are just optimizing like for half a second of a function that is used once a day, you don't want to spend, I don't know, you don't, you don't want to spend four days just optimizing this. Um, and basically this is something that you are going to realize at the end. Um, because if you are building your, your function, you are writing your backend and you are, you are under the impression that this, app, this function is not fast enough. Um, but it's like an impression. This is something that you think. Uh, but starting with, I don't know, losing four days or maybe less, maybe losing four hours, just optimizing this function just to gain alpha second. And at the end of the, of the day, you deploy the app and you realize that this function is called like once a week. So you spend four hours just to gain alpha second on a function which is called once a week um, because you haven't like, really analyzed, uh, you haven't benchmarked, you, uh, you just like going on a feeling that this application, that, that this function is not fast enough. And uh, of course, it's kind of um, a hard uh, process to optimize, just to think, uh, to find a good way to optimize. And is it worth the time? So is it worth the time? This is uh, the question you uh, should ask yourself. Do I spend four days? optimizing for alpha second of a function that is called once a week. Um, this is something I wish I had known because I've lost, I was optimizing uh, just at the end, uh, realizing that this wasn't worth my time. Of course, always benchmark uh, because you have to prove that it's faster. And yeah, don't sacrifice readability. Uh, this is something which is uh, kind of, um, very important is that, for example, if you're trying to take a standard function and then 
um, you are, I don't know, converting into C++ uh, for X, X or Y uh, reason, uh, you have to uh, think about maintenance on the long run. For example, we have some internal tool with C++ in it, so it's fast, uh, but nobody can maintain it if, you, uh, if nobody knows C++. So just uh, some small things that um, if you think you can optimize something that you can work on is using a database as a backend instead of uh, carrying the whole data set uh, with your application. Of course, caching rocks. Um, if you, you can cache the outputs of your render or of your call, um, basically it works very well if the answer is predictable and uh, you can also cache your shiny results inside an external database just to um, scale a little bit more your caching. There is always JavaScript that can help. And um, of course, uh, there is the parallel or async um, things that you can do inside your app. So my fifth tip is basically that something which is elegant is not always the most stable or the most um, uh, the most efficient. And this is uh, very uh, shiny specific because for example, if you have uh, this piece of code uh, inside shiny, so um, observe um, and you know reactive values and everything, they are very elegant. Uh, every time you call this function, it updates and everything. But if you take this piece of code, it's kind of um, very elegant the way it works uh, because you know everything will update itself. But it's kind of hard also if you have a look at this piece of code to know where it is going to be run. Because you don't know if something is a function, something is a reactive value, something is a reactive var, something is some things like that. It's kind of hard to know exactly when this piece of code. So it's very elegant. They are very elegant structures, but they make the code harder to read if you compare to something like that. Observe event. Yeah. So observe event, you always know, for example, when this piece of code will be run. It's kind of a little bit less elegant because you have to define yourself, you got to take time to think about when do I need this code to be run. Um, but the idea is that um, it's more stable because it doesn't, um, it is not triggered without input dollar save being invalidated. The old project uses an input. Uh, they, are, they, can't they can change, but it's not going to update your uh, code. So this is why you think that observe is kind of elegant, but uh, it's less stable because what we want is um, to um, run code under a small control number of invalidation points. You don't want um, you don't want your code to run. Um, I don't know if, if you have a look at this one. Maybe it's online. Uh, two, three, or maybe eight, or maybe, I don't know. So it's kind of um, hard to know when this will be run. Uh, so you want a control, a small set of uh, invalidation points. And of course, you want to see it at a glance because uh, if you have like a large code base, I've seen like observe like this, which are hundreds of lines of code. And basically, you don't know where, where and when uh, this block is invalidated. Okay, so yeah, we don't want reactivity to over happen. We don't want to have some structures that are hard to uh, read. So this is why I think like observe events is a better solution. And we have kind of the same with reactive, reactive val and reactive values. Um, because if you read the first block 
of code. You don't know which is the computation, which is the data update, which one is reactivity. So which one is pure backend function, which one is um, reactive val, which one is uh, reactive. It's kind of hard to, uh, to understand compared to the code block uh, on the bottom where uh, you have a list where you assign, um, so you compute some values and you assign it to a list. So this is why I usually advise for this uh, pattern for um, building your app inside your code. So it's a little bit less elegant because you have to specify more things, but um, creating a reactive values, always use observe event um, and then render uh, something which is stored uh, inside the um, reactive value. So yeah, Raphael asked in the chat, do you use observe event instead of observe bind event? So uh, as far as I can tell, there is the same result. So instead of um, observe event and listing the events, you list the event inside the bind event. So I think it's more or less the same pattern. So it's a little bit older, but yeah, bind event is a new thing in uh, Shiny. But it's the same spirit as far as I know. So it's more readable because you know when the computation will happen and what is rendered, you have more control. And of course, it's uh, easier to maintain because you can identify exactly the different structure. And of course, my last tip. So everything not tested will eventually fail um, because you know um, all these part of the Titanic passed the unit test. But uh, you always, if you have some parts of the uh, your software which is not uh, test, um, if you don't have automated test, it you will end up with um, users being your unit test. And this is not what you want. So you don't want your user to discover the bugs. You want to catch the, bug, the bugs before they are sent to production. That's why I think it's very important to uh, always test everything you do um, in production. So you have to test the R code, of course. You have to test your front end, and you have to test the uh, load. So testing the R code, I'm going to uh, be talking a lot about this because it's kind of uh, standard, but you have test that. So test that are other frameworks which are useful to test your R code and just be sure that you're, you're not breaking anything. Um, you also want to test your front end. So basically your uh, UI. You have shiny tests and I think you have shiny tests too now. Um, which are in R and uh, one tool I like to use uh, is written Node.js, uh, which is called Puppeteers. And what Puppeteer do, does is that it launches um, uh, Google Chrome Atlas. It connects to your app. It performs a series of action and tells you to do some tests. Uh, so you have to know how to write it in uh, Node.js, but it works uh, very well. So uh, it's very well, uh, very well documented and everything. So. Um, I would advise to um, have a look uh, into it. Then the last thing you want to test is the load. Um, because for example, um, we tried to, um, we, we wrote a shiny app, we put it on connect, uh, then we um, send it to uh, our client, our client send it to, a bunch of users, um, they all connected to the app and it just like DDoSR uh, uh, connect. So basically it took so much RAM that, that R connect just uh, stopped. Uh, so the idea is just to think about how many RAM, how many CPU and how many, uh, yeah, how many computer resources uh, your application is going to need. So you have shiny load test uh, in R, um, R. You also have uh, Docker stats, which is a wrapper around the stats from uh, Docker. And um, the idea is that you launch your Docker container and you see how many uh, CPU and RAM your shiny application is 
using. So to sum up uh, what I've said and all the things I wish I had known before, uh, all the errors I've made, uh, building shiny apps, uh, planning ahead, it will save uh, lives. It's always important to think about your uses. There are uh, the reason why you are writing your application. Uh, less is more. Uh, please don't add a widget just for the sake of adding a widget. Um, Elegant is not necessarily efficient. And of course, test all the things always. And if you want to learn a bit more about all this stuff, uh, you have the uh, Engineering Shiny uh, book that you can find in uh, paperback, or you can find it online on engineeringshiny.org. And now to the question. Thank you. Well, then, thank you very much indeed. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, please either post them in the chat or raise your hand, or, and then uh, I'm sure Colin would be happy to address them. And sure. in the meantime, please do complete the evaluation form. Colin, um, if I if I may ask a question, how long have you been using Concept Map? Uh, I think um, maybe maybe two or three years, probably. And, and is there a tool uh, uh, online for those? Do you know? Uh, I've, uh, yeah, I've you. I'm using uh, XMind, so it's a desktop. Um, Software, but uh, so it's okay. I have to check uh, where. Um, so it's yeah X, so like the letter X mine. So it's free. So you can you can buy it and you can also buy a license, but it's free. And, and, and uh, yeah, I mean either this or also Xcalidro. So Xcalidro is a tool to draw on your um, on your browser inside your browser, which I use a lot to do either design or even you know. Concept map. And this is why maybe other people are also thinking about when you have drawn your concept map or you've sketched out the user interface, uh, what sort of reaction or engagement do you get from your stakeholders or your clients when they see that representation? Um, it's usually so. What's in, what's what is interesting about it is that it usually starts some discussion and it raises some questions or things they didn't see up front. Uh, so um, it kind of so they have a little list of specification and it kinds of embodies the app for the first first time. So this is like the first encounter with what will become the apps. So they usually have some stuff that they haven't, yeah, think upfront. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's usually a good, a good tool because it, yeah, it opens to discussion. And instead of spending time developing something, you have your drawing and you can discuss the parts. Uh, so it's kind of a good tool for that. Um, and do you think the example you gave of the uh of the location app you developed where the server was in a remote location and did not connect to the internet. Would that have picked, been picked up, you think? Mm. It's, I don't know, it's kind of a, a weird use case because basically this, uh, so we were writing an application for a client that then sent this application to the IT, so we, even if I suppose that even if we had done that, it wouldn't have catch these specific things because it was an IT thing. So it's kind of why I think it's a bit important to um, yeah to discuss where is this going to be deployed? Can you can I talk to people in the IT? Uh, are you sure it will work? 
uh, we usually so so yeah i have like some dockerized shiny apps so if you if it's deployed in shine in a docker context i have some example docker container that i send them and say can you deploy it does it work uh, yeah that's why we ask a lot of questions now and we try to discuss with the it just to be sure that it will work at the end of the day so yeah even things with um, yeah is it is it is, can it connect to the internet? But also, what is the R version? What are the packages that are allowed? Do you have uh, these system requirements and stuff like that? Which uh, because it can drive, it can impact the way you are going to build your app. For example, if uh, we have this, for example, the IT says we have this OS, we have this Linux version and this R version, and we do have only this. Uh, system requirements available you are going to need to choose carefully the packages you are going to use uh, for example some uh, a company i work for they do a screening of all the package all the packages you need for security issues for example you have to scan and you have they have to validate all the packages so basically um, we send the it and the security team a list of packages we want and they say yes or no uh, but if we don't do that, basically we build the app and at some point they say no, but we, we can't allow this package to be on our internal CRAN. So this is why I think, yeah, coding is very important to have a lot of discussion and a lot of planning and a lot of thinking about building and deploying uh, before starting, starting to actually build and deploy. Thank you so much, uh, Colin. Oh, very, um... Very important lessons and insights and wisdom you've shared with us. So thank you so much. Um, Thanks for having me. No, we're delighted. Uh, and uh, we hope you'll join us again. There's always much fun to be had with uh, with uh, uh, kind of the, uh, experts like you sharing their insight with us. So uh, I'd like uh, on that note, um, if people could uh, just show our appreciation for Colin through a virtual round of applause or a thumbs up, <laughs> that would be really good. And uh, we look forward to seeing you and colleagues on uh, uh, on other events for the NHS. Sure. So thank you, everybody. Have a lovely day, and uh, th and we can now sign off. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.